Hello and welcome to all of you. You're watching Tech24 for us 24s Tech Show. Coming up, advances in genetic engineering are reviving the idea of de-extinction or whether to bring back extinct animals to try to save endangered ecosystems. But is this truly a good idea and what would be the unforeseen consequences of such an act? We speak to the American startup Colossal, which is working on bringing back the woolly mammoth. And in Test24, we show you how agricultural technology can improve yield, efficiency, and profitability with a device that lets you identify remotely if cows and sheep are in good health and if they are lacking anything. Now, there is no other creature on Earth that has inspired so much fear and respect at the same time. Dinosaurs appeared some 245 million years ago. Some measured more than 20 meters and weighed up to 20 tons. Today, their evolution and extinction process is still full of unknowns and subject to controversy. But scientists are still making groundbreaking discoveries everywhere across the globe. Yinka Oyentade has the story. Six and a half meters tall and as long as a basketball court. These are the remains of one of the largest dinosaurs to have ever walked the earth. Meet Oscillotitan cooperensis. Part of the dinosaur's bones were discovered in Queensland. Paleontologists say it's Australia's biggest ever. Each dinosaur bone can weigh hundreds of kilos, but we use digital scanning technology to actually create three-dimensional models of each of these bones. Back in their day, Oscillotitan cooperensis would have found its match in this long-necked dinosaur that was unearthed in Argentina. Researchers say this creature may have been up to 15 meters tall. Part of the sauropod species, this plant-eating dinosaur lived 98 million years ago. If being a giant killing machine was not enough protection, ankylosaurs were heavily armored. These fossils unearthed in Morocco may be the most unusual remnants discovered yet. They are the first to be found with spikes attached to the skeleton. This specimen actually has spikes and uh, an osteoderm or a plate fused to a rib, so it's attached firmly to the rib and, and couldn't have come apart. And that is really weird. We don't see that in any other ankylosaur. And in fact, we don't see that in any other vertebrate that we know of, living or dead. These extraordinary fossils are the first ankylosaurus bones to be discovered in Africa. And the very latest breakthrough regarding dinosaurs comes from China. Two weeks ago, scientists were able to isolate some cells from a dinosaur that lived 125 million years ago. Well-preserved organic molecules that you can see here in pink. And this could perhaps imply strands of DNA. Of course, this has revived the idea of trying to bring dinosaurs back to life and create a sort of Jurassic Park. Rumors have it that this is actually what Neuralink co-founder Max Hodak wants to do, as he recently tweeted. But creating or reviving species raises many ethical questions. How would humanity be consulted on this issue? And what would be the unforeseen consequences of reintroducing an animal in an ecosystem? Well, meanwhile, there is a serious argument about whether resuscitating certain animals could in fact rebuild entire ecosystems to the benefit of the planet. De-extinction, if you will, as a step further to conservation. While well, scientists at the University of California even published guidelines for how to choose which species to revive, with the woolly mammoth and the passenger pigeon coming in first. Well, for more on this, let's turn to our guest, who is getting rather close to reviving the extinct species. I'm talking about Ben Lam, the CEO and founder of Colossal, who joins us now. Hello. Thank you so much, Julia, for having us. So, Ben, how exactly do you plan to revive the woolly mammoth? Well, to be clear, what we're doing is we're actually reviving woolly mammoth genes. And so, as you know, the woolly mammoth is extinct, but there's about 60 genes that make the woolly mammoth cold tolerant. And we're actually leveraging, taking uh, those genes in, in cutting edge genetic engineering technologies uh, like CRISPR and others to then insert them into an Asian elephant cell line. So we're actually, we like to call them Arctic elephants uh, because they, even though they uh, express the, the phenotype, the physical attributes of uh, of a mammoth, they are part Asian elephant and part woolly mammoth. And so we're leveraging these genetic engineering technologies to essentially combine the two uh, species to create our, our functional woolly mammoths. So how far along the process are you and can you give us an idea of when this new woolly mammoth might take its first breath? So we're targeting four to six years and we feel pretty confident about that timeline. My co-founder, Dr. George Church, who's the world-renowned geneticist and who's been working on the Mammoth Project for over a decade, has actually identified 
you know, the 60 genes actually de-extincted several of those genes and actually tested them uh, in the lab and, and showed that they, they work. Um, and then we've also done extensive research on existing elephant genomes and then extinct elephant genomes. And so we have a pretty clear map of, of where we're going. And then we also have all the, the actual genes that, that uh, exhibit those, those cold tolerant traits. And so for us, it's really now just about making the final edits, testing those edits, and then uh, once we get to viable embryos, uh, leveraging uh, next-gen technologies like artificial wombs uh, or a form of surrogacy uh, in order to bring them back. So four to six years is our goal. Now, you say that bringing uh, the mammoth back would have a positive impact on the ecosystem and even help combat global warming. But how can you be so sure that it won't have a negative effect like spreading disease or displacing existing species? That, uh, that's a great question. So we're working pretty closely with uh, the folks at Blyzestein Park, Sergey and Nikita Zimov, uh, who are uh, Russian ecologists who spent a ton of time and spent decades uh, working with the Russian government and actually evaluating the impacts for Arctic rewilding uh, and actually returning uh, the Arctic grasslands. And so what's great about the mammoths is unlike a genetically modified mosquito or small species, we can be pretty thoughtful about understanding the unintended consequences. You know, we're not releasing something that's small, that breeds very, very quickly and that we can't control. We can be very, very thoughtful uh, around uh, if we need to roll back uh, uh, any of the rewilding efforts we can. But a lot of work has gone into the extensive studies of what Arctic rewilding can do and the positive impacts uh, to climate change. So we're going to be very thoughtful about where we put them. We're going to make sure that they, they not only are they not an invasive species, but they also that they don't uh, uh, you know, uh, mess with any uh, indigenous people of the region. So we're, we're going to be pretty thoughtful on the placement. But just given their size, we actually have the ability to, to roll it back you know, uh, if there are any unintended consequences. But part of that's also working with, you know, top scientific advisors uh, and ecologists and, and, and uh, geneticists around the world. Ben Lam, thank you very much indeed for that. Thank you so much for having me. And while some people like Colossal are looking at de-extincting species, others want to do quite the opposite and use it to make some animals extinct. Well, to talk more about it, let's turn to uh, Peter. Hello, Peter. Welcome. Hello, Julia. So tell us more about this process of trying to get rid of certain species. Uh, it's called planned extinction. Yeah, the impetus came from the desire to protect fragile ecosystems, notably ones on islands like Hawaii, like the, like the Galapagos, or even Socotra off the coast of Yemen. Um, which you can see here. Now, dozens of invertebrate species on these islands have vanished in the last century, and dozens more are on the path to extinction. That's because animals and insects not native to these islands have been introduced by humans, whether or not by accident, and have consequently outcompeted the indigenous animals there. That's why the first experiments in in planned extinction could take place on such islands. In September, the International Union for the Cons Conservation of Nature endorsed a notion for synthetic biology, including a type of genetic engineering called gene drive. For instance, genetically modifying a rat so that, that, so that its offspring is only one sex. They would then mate with the other rats, rats on the island, but only produce more male rats. And in a few generations, well, you wouldn't have any more rats because you wouldn't have any more females. So there are examples of gene drive to protect this time humans uh, genetically modifying mosquitoes, for instance, to make sure that they can't uh, transmit, let's say, malaria anymore. Yeah. Maybe let's go back on this idea of gene drive. How does it work? Well, just ch changing the genetic information of one organism is not actually enough. Uh, for a full gene drive, you need to make sure the desired genes carry down through its offspring and their offspring until a whole species is one we've genetically engineered. It works by including a bit of code in the genetically modified insect or animal that tells the new sequence to continue to search for and replace the undesired sequence. So when your mosquito, for instance, mates with other mosquitoes, it's more likely to carry the genetic modification that makes it resistant to malaria. We've had the means to do this for years, but of course, such a powerful tool carries huge risks, which is why scientists, scientists are still very hesitant to roll it out. Thank you very much, Peter. Let's move on now to Test 24. In 1885, there were 160 of them around Europe, and today there are far more, and despite this, you may not have heard of them. Peter, you're about to tell us more about experimental farms. 
Yes, I am, Julia. Weirdly, we still tend to have a vision of farming as very pastoral and sort of detached from te technological advances. That couldn't be further from the truth. Take, for example, Agro Paris Tech, which is one of the most prestigious universities in France, is entirely dedicated to the science of agronomy. It actually runs an experimental farm in Grignon, to the west of Paris, complete with 200 cows, 600 che um, sheep, and plenty of technology. And one of which is one of the devices you have here on the set? Yes, you can think of this as a kind of Fitbit for cows. It helps them do their 10,000 steps a day, of course. No, not really. It obviously um, reads when they are moving around more or less, notably to check whether a cow is in heat, because when they're in heat, they'll move around more. And 14 hours later, well, you know what the farmer's going to do. Strap on his big glove and you know what happens next. I can imagine. Yes. If they're moving around less, then, of course, that means they could be ill. Um, and obviously, it's better for the farmer to intervene as quickly as possible. It also pairs with a sensor at the feeding trough to show the amount of time that cows are spending eating, another indication of their health. Now, when we talk about, you know, identifying patterns, of course, we're thinking about artificial intelligence. Yes. So the startup AI, AI Herd um, from Nantes has developed a system which uses 360 degree cameras installed in a farm's stables. And it uses AI algorithms to analyze the behavior of the cows, thus detecting any unusual behavior that might, again, be a sign of sickness. Like the pedometer, the system allows the farmer to intervene quickly when an animal's unwell, not only saving the farm money, but reducing the suffering of the animals as well, which is important because, of course, many viral diseases are endemic in cattle populations. Thank you, Peter. You've convinced us that farming is becoming more high-tech. Thank you. It brings us to the end of this week's edition of Tech24. We, of course, hope that you enjoyed it, and we'll see you soon.